Journey into Righteousness, a 40-day devotional by Alexander McConnell. The article of justification must be sounded in our ears incessantly because the frailty of our flesh will not permit us to take hold of it perfectly and to believe it with all our heart. Martin Luther Introduction At the dawning of Jesus' ministry, he was led by the Spirit into the Judean wilderness and severely tested. At his weakest point, after forty days and nights of fasting, he faced a final onslaught of cunning attacks from the devil. Our king passed through the relentless fires of temptation like heavenly gold, before returning to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Then Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, and news of him spread throughout the surrounding area. Luke 4 verse 14 I believe the Holy Spirit has led you to this book, because He wants you to experience a 40-day challenge of your own. He wants to challenge you to believe the Gospel more, so that you might live in the miraculous power of the Spirit. Jesus' mission was to fulfill all righteousness, and one day offer it to you as a gift. Your assignment is to live by faith that you are righteous in Christ, which is no easy feat, especially in a world that loves to condemn you over every little thing. Accepting this challenge has the potential to change your life forever. Once you are established in righteousness, and know that God is always pleased with you because of Jesus, the devil will flee from you, and demonic fear and oppression will become a distant memory. In righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Isaiah 54 verse 14 as you become more and more established in the reality that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, more of your inheritance will be released to you. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4 verse 13 You will also be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Philippians 1 verse 11 being filled with the fruit of righteousness sounds good, but what does it look like in real life? Isaiah, prophesying just under 3,000 years ago, reveals the answer. The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. Isaiah 32 verse 17 The word for peace, means to be safe, well, happy, friendly, healthy, and prosperous. It is a picture of wholeness. The word quietness, means to rest, settle, and be still. It is a picture of tranquility. Lastly, the word confidence, means to be safe, secure, and full of hope. It is a picture of security. Is your heart longing to experience the tangible power and personal leading of the Spirit of God? Are you ready to step into the glorious and limitless inheritance that is yours through Jesus Christ? If so, let us begin our journey into righteousness. Day 1. Your righteousness is in heaven. It is because of Him, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. There are many things in heaven, that you will not be able to find on earth today. For example, you won't be able to find the throne of God the new Jerusalem, or your righteousness. When you welcome Jesus Christ as your Savior, He became your righteousness. If you sin today, your righteousness remains perfect in heaven. Absolutely nothing you do, can affect your right standing with God ever again. You have been completely set free from the need to perform for God's approval. You already have it, thanks to your Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. 1 John 2 verse 1 there are still many good reasons to resist sin and pursue a life of holiness, but no matter how well you walk, God continues to see you as righteous the entire time. Let me be clear about this from the beginning. There are many good reasons to resist sin and pursue holiness, but maintaining your right standing with God is not one of them. In his spiritual autobiography, Grace Abounding, John Bunyan describes the nature of his walk with the Lord before he understood that he was righteous apart from works. 
One day, he is exploding with heavenly joy, confident that the blood of Jesus has forever removed his sins, and the next day, he is fearful and riddled with doubt, believing that he may still be going to hell. During this intense inner conflict, he received a supernatural message from God that set him free. But one day, as I was passing into the field, with some dashes on my conscience, fearing yet that all was not right, suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul. Your righteousness is in heaven. I thought I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There was my righteousness. Wherever I was, or whatever I was doing, God could not save me that I lacked His righteousness, for that was ever before Him. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away. From that time, those dreadful scriptures of God quit troubling me. Now I went home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. John Bunyan learned that it was not his earthly behavior, but his heavenly high priest, that kept him forever right with God. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore he is able, once and forever, to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Hebrews 7 verses 24-25 NLT Are you afraid that you might do something in the future, that makes you unrighteous again? If so, fear no more, because God has made Jesus your righteousness. Your right standing with God is perfect and will never change, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See Hebrews 13 verse 8. If you believe that Jesus is your righteousness, wherever you are, or whatever you are doing, you can go through today, rejoicing for the grace and love of God, just like John Bunyan did all those years ago. When the old fears begin threatening you again, you can remind your soul, that your righteousness is in heaven. Day 2. Your only boast. But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Galatians 6 verse 14. You are righteous today only because Jesus lived a perfect life, suffered the punishment for your sins on the cross, and then rose again to be your everlasting righteousness. He did all of this willingly so that you could enjoy a personal relationship with God forever. Jesus has provided righteousness for every single human being in existence. The only barrier stopping anyone from being reconciled to God and made righteous, is unbelief. As one who believes in Jesus, you have been reconciled to God and made righteous. In this life, you can live every day with a clear conscience because Jesus has taken away your sins. You can be confident that the God of the galaxies is for you at all times, working all things together for your good. You can relate to God as your Father and get to know Him personally. These blessings, and so much more, are yours today because the Lord Jesus has qualified you for them. You can't earn the blessings of God. You have to receive them freely. Nevertheless, there are millions, if not billions of people in the world, who believe they will get into heaven because they have done enough good things to merit it. Such people think God should bless and accept them because they have tried their best to be good. They are confident that their acts of righteousness are enough to save them. Thus, they are self-righteous and see no need to trust in Jesus. Jesus told a parable to self-righteous people, to help them trust in God's grace alone. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Luke 18 verses 9-14 
the Pharisee boasted in his law-keeping, and God ignored him. The tax collector sought after mercy, and God justified him. Clearly, God accepts people who trust in his mercy, and not in their good works. Who do you identify with most in this parable? If you are anything like me, you can relate to both men. The only way to free your heart from self-righteousness is to boast in the cross alone. You must continually remind yourself that. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 verse 5 The more revelation you receive concerning the finished work of Jesus, the more you will be delivered from the deception of self-righteousness. You will soon know without a shadow of a doubt that you have nothing to boast in except the grace of God. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 3 verses 27-28 Paul had so much revelation about the grace of God, that he called himself a fool, a madman, an insane person, when he chose to boast about himself to the Corinthian church, see 2 Corinthians 11 verse 23. This is an appropriate response to someone who glories in what they have done for Christ, instead of what Christ did for them. They are acting like someone who has gone insane. We all go a little crazy at times, so if you find yourself exalting your works, and looking down on others, treat it as a symptom of unbelief, and begin to boast anew in Jesus' finished work. As you live by faith that you are righteous apart from works, you will begin to experience profound happiness. And in this same way, David speaks of the blessing on the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed, and happy, and favored, are those whose lawless acts have been forgiven, and whose sins have been covered up, and completely buried. Romans 4 verses 6-7 Amplified Bible Never let anyone make you feel unworthy, guilty, or condemned, because of your behavior. God so loved you, that He gave His only Son to make you righteous. That is something you can boast about forever. Day 3. Fully Forgiven. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Psalm 103 verses 2-3. The exact second you receive Jesus as your Savior, you receive forgiveness for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Your sins are gone forever. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Hebrews 10 verses 17-18 Even though God has already forgiven all of your sins, you have not lived all of your life yet. Therefore, when you miss the mark in the future, you will be tempted to believe that He will be angry with you. In real time, you decide to sin, and feel guilty because of what you have done. You think God sees you in your sins, but He still sees you in His Son. You remain holy and without blemish in His sight. God will discipline you when you are going astray, because He wants you to fulfill your potential and experience the peaceable fruit of righteousness, Hebrews 12 verse 11. But please don't think of a naughty step. There is only encouragement to take steps in the right direction a direction that leads to life. God doesn't push you away from Himself when you sin. If anything, He pulls you closer. Don't expect the devil to remind you of this. Any time you fall into sin, He will be quick to point an accusing finger at you. To avoid coming under condemnation, you need to remind yourself that God has sworn that He will never get angry with you, or rebuke you. For this is like the waters of Noah to me for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. Isaiah 54 verse 9 The Hebrew word for rebuke, is the same word used when Joseph shared his dream with his father. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? 
Shall your mother and I, and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Genesis 37 verse 10 Joseph shared something personal and controversial with his earthly father and received a rebuke for doing so. I have no doubt he was hurt by his father's reaction. I'm sure you can relate. How many times have you shared something vulnerable with a loved one, hoping to find understanding and support, and all you receive is a rebuke of some kind? I have good news for you. God has sworn that He will never rebuke you that way. No matter what you share with God, you can be 100% sure that He will not get angry with you or rebuke you. When God swore never to flood the earth again, He did so without adding any condition. No matter how wicked this world becomes, you can be confident that He will never send another worldwide flood to destroy humanity. In the same way, no matter how destructive your behavior might become, God has promised that He will only be kind to you. Your Heavenly Father's kindness towards you is more secure than the mountains. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Isaiah 54 verse 10 Why does God continue to treat you with kindness? when your sins deserve wrath and judgment? There's only one answer that makes sense. The Gospel. Your Savior has already suffered God's punishment for all of your sins, so you don't have to. Divine justice has been satisfied. Therefore, God can always look upon you favorably. Living a godly life is still vital for many reasons, but you must be careful not to base your righteousness upon your godliness. One night I had a dream that helped me understand the difference. I saw a little boy, about five years old, playing with a toy boat and a toilet. I rushed over to him and said, Don't play in that water. It's dirty. Even though that little boy was doing something unclean, he remained innocent in my eyes. In the same way, even when you sin, you remain innocent in God's eyes. Since God is a good father, he will discourage you from playing around in the dirty waters of sin. Nevertheless, your behavior cannot change how He sees you, because Jesus' blood has made you eternally innocent. Day 4 The Obedience of Christ And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself, and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. Philippians 2 verse 8 How many sins do you have to commit to become a sinner? The answer is none. Ever since Adam disobeyed God, every single person has been born in sin. It may not seem fair, but it is a spiritual fact. We all come into this world with Adam's fallen spiritual nature in us, just like we are all born having received some bad genes from our parents. David clearly expressed this truth. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 51 verse 5 Thankfully, God did not leave us in our helpless and hopeless condition. Although under no obligation to do so, God provided an easy way for us to be redeemed. He did this, not by sending us a list of rules, but by sending His Son. Jesus, the last Adam, succeeded where the first Adam failed. Adam was tempted in paradise, surrounded by love, safety, and abundance, and he gave in. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, surrounded by snakes, scorpions, and lack, and he overcame every temptation he faced. Not only did Jesus resist all sin, but he also intentionally fulfilled all righteousness, as is seen in his interaction with John the Baptist. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Matthew 3 verses 14 to 15 A few chapters later, Jesus explained that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5 verse 17 KJV Jesus lived a perfectly obedient life and fulfilled the law to the letter. 
However, instead of enjoying the blessings of the righteous, our Lord died like the wicked. Jesus' sufferings, which were associated with God's curse, caused some people to reason that He was not a righteous man. They didn't understand that He was suffering for our sins, not His own. Jesus was carrying away the sins, sicknesses, and curses of the entire world in His own body. We turned our backs on Him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses He carried, it was our sorrows that weighed Him down. And we thought His troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for His own sins. Isaiah 53 verses 3-4 NLT Even though Jesus lived a righteous life, He suffered the consequences of your sins, so that even though you have lived a sinful life, you may enjoy the rewards of His righteousness. God even changed your nature. In the same way that you became a sinner by nature, because of Adam's disobedience, you became righteous by nature, because of Jesus' obedience. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Romans 5 verse 19 You were born again in true righteousness and holiness when you believed the gospel. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4 verse 24 You are now a righteous person, and in the same way that doing good works while you were a sinner, could not change your old self, doing evil works, now that you are righteous, cannot change your new self. You are righteous because of the new birth. Your obedience has nothing to do with it. The only obedience that is necessary for you to be made righteous, is what Paul called the obedience to the faith, Romans 1 verse 5 ESV, which means believing the gospel message. Therefore, an obedient person in the new covenant, is someone who accepts the gospel, and a disobedient person is someone who rejects it. Of course, you can still be disobedient to the Spirit's leading, but if you continue to believe that you remain righteous in these times, you will undoubtedly learn to walk with Him more consistently in the long run. If the enemy has been playing mind games with you, implying that your righteousness depends on your obedience, I encourage you to say the following words out loud. I do not trust in my behavior to keep me right with God. I trust in Jesus' obedience. I am the righteousness of God because of what my Savior did, not because of what I do. I believe the gospel. Appealing to your obedience never silences the devil's accusations, but pointing to Jesus' obedience always leaves him speechless. Every time you respond to condemnation with the gospel, you are bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Day 5 Forever Alive For by the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relation to it, once for all. In the life that he lives, he is living to God, in unbroken fellowship with Him. Even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin, and your relation to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with Him, in Christ Jesus. Romans 6 verses 10-11, Amplified Bible One day, I was feeling far from God, and my soul began filling with fear. In my spirit, I heard a gentle, reassuring voice say, you no longer exist apart from me. I believe the Lord Jesus was reminding me that I am one with Him. Therefore, I cannot be far from God. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Colossians 3 verse 3 You were once dead in sin, see Ephesians 2 verse 1, meaning that you were joined to sin and separated from God. However, now you have died to sin, meaning that you are united to God and separated from sin. Your sins are as far away from you as the East is from the West, an infinite distance. He has removed our sins as far from us, as the East is from the West. Psalm 103 verse 12 When you believe the Gospel, you are forever set free from sin. You are now as free from sin as Jesus, because you are in Him. I do not doubt that you are still battling with sinful behavior of some kind 
but you are no longer a slave of sin, even when you are acting like it. You are now a slave of righteousness. Over time, you can change your behavior gradually, but God has already changed your identity completely. But God be thanked, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 6 verses 17-18 When Jesus died on the cross, He died to the realm of sin forever. For the rest of eternity, He lives in the love and favor of God. Since this is true for Jesus, it is also true for you, because you are in Him. You will not always feel like you have died to sin and are forever pleasing to God. Some days you will feel like He is angry with you. I trust you have already realized that your feelings can be deceptive. You can't always rely on your emotions to communicate truth, but you can always rely on what God says, because His Word is truth. The Apostle Paul explicitly teaches believers to think of themselves as those who have died to sin and are now alive to God. For the death that He died, He died to sin, once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6 verses 10-11 In his book, Living Under Grace, preaching through Romans 6 verse 1, to 7 verse 25, Michael Eaton, commenting on the above verses, writes, What does it mean to reckon? It means you grasp hold of what has happened to Jesus then it means that you realize that what is true of him is true of you. He has died to the realm of sin. He is living in a new realm in the presence of God. Whenever you wake up each morning, you are to reckon that you have permanently left the realm of sin. You now live in unbroken fellowship with God and Christ. God wants you to be conscious of this spiritual reality as you go about your day, so that you can delight in his love, experience his power, and walk in newness of life. Day 6. Rest and Discover Grace There remains therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Hebrews 4 verses 9-11 A vast number of the children of Israel were not able to enter into the promised land because of their unbelief in God's goodness. Today, much of the church has not entered into God's promise of rest for the same reason. We find it too hard to believe that God would make us righteous as a free gift. We think there must be some catch, something we must contribute. How do you enter into rest? You must decide to stop working to be right with God or to deserve a blessing from Him. You already have these things in Christ. See 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Ephesians 1 verse 3. In the same way that God stopped working on the seventh day of creation, because He had finished everything, you too must rest from working, because God has already made you righteous and blessed in Christ. There is nothing more for you to do, except enjoy God and His glorious blessings. This is why it's such a wicked thing to keep rules with the intention of earning God's favor. When someone tries to keep the Ten Commandments, or any commandment for that matter, to earn something from God, they are saying, Jesus didn't finish the job. I'll have to finish it myself. Don't get me wrong. There are times when you will need to prepare yourself to inherit a blessing, but this is very different from trying to earn it. Sometimes God will withhold a good thing from you, because you are not ready for it. It would do you more harm than good, because you are still in need of more training. I have lost count, of how many times I have complained to God, about not having a particular blessing, only to hear Him say, Son, if I gave you that today, would you be able to handle it? My answer is always no. Once I can see past my impatience, I am thankful that God doesn't give me everything I desire straight away, because an inheritance gained hastily, will not be blessed in the end. See Proverbs 20 verse 21. It is always wise to prepare for blessings, but it is foolish to attempt to earn them. 
trying to work for what God freely offers, is what causes believers to fall from grace. Contrary to popular belief, falling from grace is not stumbling into sin, but descending into legalism. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Galatians 5 verse 4 NLT Returning to works of self-righteousness is the vilest act of disobedience possible because it undermines the finished work of Christ. The only way to keep yourself from falling from grace is by working hard not to work. Yes, you heard that correctly. You remain in God's favor by laboring to rest. Let us labor therefore, to enter into that rest. Hebrews 4 verse 11 KJV I am not encouraging you to quit your job or to stay in bed all day. I am saying you should work hard to believe that Jesus has made you righteous. Your devotional acts, whether they are worshiping, praying, or reading the scriptures, should always emphasize Christ's devotion to you, not your devotion to the Lord. You must continually labor to understand the finished work of Jesus and all that He has achieved for you. If you don't, you will end up trying to get what you already have in Christ. Your image of God will slowly become distorted, and your relationship with Him will suffer. Paradoxically, when you do cease from your works and enter God's promise of rest, you will, in time, find yourself working harder than you ever have before. Grace will take effect and inspire you to do wonderful things in the strength of the Lord, just like Paul, who declared, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 Joseph Prince, the senior pastor of New Creation Church in Singapore, notes that the first person to find grace in the Bible was Noah, and that Noah means rest. Only when you enter God's rest, will you discover His grace. Will you cease from your self-righteous works? Will you humbly accept that Jesus has already done everything to make you forever right with God? If so, you are now positioned to inherit all the blessings God has for you. Day 7 The Ministry of the Spirit But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses, because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? 2 Corinthians 3 verses 7-8 According to Jesus, the kingdom of heaven will consist of the greatest people the world has ever seen, the sons and daughters of God, see Matthew 11 verse 11. All of God's children are unique and have equally unique callings. As a result, the body of Christ offers a seemingly endless list of ministries. Although countless ministries exist in the church, they all fall into one of two categories. 1. The ministry of the letter, which kills. 2. The ministry of the Spirit, which gives life. The Apostle Paul contrasted these two ministries in his second letter to the Corinthians. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 As a believer, it is crucial to discern between these two ministries. It is a matter of life and death, not only for you, but also for whoever God calls you to influence. Why do you think Paul instructed Timothy to watch over his life and teaching closely? He knew that false doctrine destroyed people, and sound doctrine saved them. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 1 Timothy 4 verse 16 Timothy was already saved, so why did Paul say, you will save both yourself and your hearers? The answer is clear when we understand what the word save means. The Greek word Paul used, is sozo, and means to deliver, and make whole. Paul was informing Timothy, that believing and teaching sound doctrine, would result in wholeness for himself and his hearers. In other words, Timothy and those he taught, 
would become spiritually, emotionally, and physically stronger as they continued in the teachings of grace. For a long time, I didn't understand this truth, because I sat under ministries that mixed law and grace, which resulted in tremendous confusion. I had no stability in my life whatsoever, because I never knew what to expect from God. I knew that I was saved and going to heaven, but at the same time, I had this deep-seated fear that God was not satisfied with me. The anxiety became so severe that I was afraid to leave my house. My skin cracked and bled so badly that I was unable to shower properly. I honestly felt like I was dying. It was during this time when I realized that I was living under the ministry of death. The Bible says the ministry of death is written and engraved on stones, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. This verse is referring to the Ten Commandments. Therefore, the ministry of death is the self-righteous system of the law, which says, If you do right, God will bless you. But if you do wrong, He will curse you. Suddenly everything became clear. The Spirit began leading me to bold ministers, who were teaching the New Covenant with clarity, and were not mixing self-righteousness into their messages. I persevered in listening to their teachings, and studying the Word for myself. Over time, I began to regain my strength. I realized that I was not only saved by grace, but I was also meant to live by it. Before this, I had believed that God's unmerited favor was for beginners and unsaved people. I felt pressured to keep a list of moral commands, and partake in acts of Christian service, to keep God happy with me. I had no idea I was living under the ministry of death. Although I was liberated by the gospel, I also felt like I should move on to other things. However, the Spirit spoke to me and said, You are never to move on from the finished work of Jesus. You are to keep moving into it. Now I serve God, and walk in His ways, not to make Him happy with me, but because He is already pleased with me. It has made all the difference in the world. Are you sitting under ministries that are filling you with life, or are they killing you? The law makes you conscious of your sins. In contrast, grace makes you conscious of your righteousness in Christ. Every message you hear should leave you feeling even more confident that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. This is the ministry of life. For the sake of clarity, I want to define the ministry of death and the ministry of life. The main elements of the ministry of death are the letter of the law, condemnation, and a temporary glory. It declares that you must fulfill endless demands to be right with God. You are obligated to work to appease the Lord in some way. The demands never stop. In contrast, the main elements of the ministry of life are the working of the Holy Spirit, the gift of righteousness, and the permanent glory of Christ. It declares that you are right with God through faith in Jesus. You freely give because you freely receive. The supply never stops. I encourage you to come out from under that weak and dusty ministry of death, and wholly embrace the revitalizing ministry of the Spirit. Under the ministry of the Spirit, your wounds will heal, your heart will grow strong, and your faith will naturally spring forth into good works. You will have life, and you will have it in abundance, as Jesus promised. The thief does not come, except to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10 verse 10 Day 8 The Fullness of God I also pray, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power, for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead, and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 1 verses 19-20, NLT Lectio Divina, is Latin for divine or sacred reading. It guides a person to study a text of scripture, and to commune with God by asking four questions. 1. What does the text say? 2. What does the text say to me personally? 3. What do I want to say to God? 4. What difference will this text make in my life? I am not the biggest fan of this kind of Bible reading.
So when I arrived at a Bible study, and realized we would be practicing this ancient method, my heart sank. Thankfully, my negative attitude could not stop God making it a night I would never forget. The person leading the study wanted us to read Ephesians 3 verses 17 to 19, which says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long, and high and deep, is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We had to read these verses out loud, before asking, what does the text say to me personally? After a few minutes, we would each share our thoughts. The idea of being filled with all the fullness of God captured my attention straight away, so I began to pray about how that might look. To my surprise, God responded by giving me a vision in my mind's eye. In the vision, I saw two enormous hands compressing the entire universe, until it had all but disappeared. The universe, which was now no bigger than a seed, was then placed inside a house, where it rapidly began to expand again. The house violently trembled as it fought to contain the power that was erupting within it. Soon the doors and windows were bursting open. Stars, planets, and streams of sky, exploded out in every direction. I felt God say, I am bigger than the universe, and you are smaller than a house. If the God who created the universe lived in me, surely it should be a struggle to contain him. He should be exploding out of every part of my being. I shared what I had seen with the group, and no one argued with it. We all believed this should be happening, but unfortunately, this was not our reality. It was time for the next question. What do I want to say to God? I had no doubts about what I wanted to say to Him. Father, I prayed. Why do I rarely experience your power, if you truly are living inside me? I didn't find my answer that night, even though it was staring me in the face. Ephesians 3 verses 17 to 19, clearly states that as a believer comprehends the greatness of God's love for them, they experience His fullness. Perfect Love The Bible is clear that God loves us, whether we ever feel it or not. Nevertheless, it should be normal to feel loved. Think about it. It is almost impossible to believe that something terrible is about to happen, without feeling fear. In the same way, it is hard to know that God adores you, without feeling loved. It is my personal conviction, that the feeling of love plays a part in casting out fear. I've noticed, that it is very hard to feel both loved and fearful, at the same time. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 1 John 4 verses 17-18 ESV According to John, the way to experience this love that casts out fear, is by understanding that you are righteous, and never have to fear God's punishment ever again. If you can accept this, God's love and power will erupt within your heart. Of course, what this looks like, will differ for every person, but in some way, God's power will affect your daily life. I also believe you will bring the completeness you have in Christ to others, just like Paul did. The same power that worked mightily in him, will work in you. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, and teaching every man, with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. Colossians 1 verses 28-29 NASB I want you to take a few minutes, and answer the final question for yourself. What difference will this text make in your life? Will you dare to believe, that you are as righteous as Jesus, and that God will never again punish you? I hope you do, because God is eagerly waiting to unleash His power. Your life will never be the same. Day 9 You are free now. Part 1 Therefore, 
there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1 When I say I'll do something tomorrow, it is my way of telling myself that I'll get round to it, just not now. I have used this phrase to put things off for so long, that I no longer believe myself when I say it. The truth is, I probably won't do it tomorrow, but I feel better saying that I will. It's completely normal to put off the things we hate. However, it's extremely abnormal to put off the things we love. Think of children on Christmas Eve. I'm not sure about you, but I used to sit up all night, counting down the hours until Christmas Day. As soon as morning arrived, I rushed downstairs to open my presents. I couldn't get to them quickly enough. Do you think I have ever been this eager to go to the dentist? Of course not. There are no excited dental patients because nobody enjoys going to the dentist. Most of us only go when the pain becomes too much to bear, and we are out of options. Now let me ask you a question. Why are you putting off being free from condemnation? when you can experience it right now. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is, right now, right this very moment, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. This very second, you should be free from every sense of guilt and shame. But why is it so hard to live free from condemnation? If you haven't realized it by now, you have an enemy whose main agenda is to spew accusations at you, see Revelation 12 verse 10. The devil hates to see you enjoying the goodness of God, because he wants to keep you feeling miserable and damned, just like him. I believe the enemy uses the following three-step process to condemn you. Step 1. He sets up a standard that you need to keep, in order to get right with God. Step 2. He points out that you are falling below the standard, and are no longer right with God. Step 3. He tells you that God is angry and disappointed with you for not reaching the standard. The only way to overcome condemnation is to refuse to judge your righteousness by your obedience to a set of external standards. Removing such requirements takes away the devil's weapon of condemnation. It disarms him. Jesus did this for us at the cross. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2 verses 14-15 When Satan says something like, I saw you coveting earlier. God is angry with you. You can reply, It's good not to covet, but coveting can't make God angry with me. That's like saying, You are speeding. You have broken the law, and will be punished, to someone who is driving in a place with no speed limit. It's good to drive sensibly, but how can they be punished for speeding, when there is no law against it? If you are discerning, you will notice the enemy falling silent. How can he accuse you of something, if you don't have to do anything? It is impossible. Jesus has completely disarmed the enemy by wiping out all requirements. However, if you think you have to share your faith, pray enough, or do something to stay right with God, you are rearming Satan. He can now accuse you of not sharing your faith enough, not praying enough, etc. In essence, if you believe you are required to do anything to stay right with God, the enemy can condemn you. I believe sharing the gospel, praying, and living a godly life, are healthy disciplines that God commands His people to pursue, but not to remain righteous. God wants you to freely pursue godliness, because of the promise it holds for this life, and the life to come. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 When I was a legalistic Christian, I believed that godliness only led to persecution, and had little benefit in this life. It is true that living a godly life invites attacks. See 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. However, godliness also improves your life in the here and now, as the previous verse clearly states. If your best friend is a believer, and you encourage one another in the faith, your relationship holds promise in this life, and the life to come. 
If you invest your wealth into advancing God's purposes here and now, your investment holds promise in this life and the next. Godly relationships, generosity, and acts of service will not be wiped out at Jesus' return. They will carry over into the new world. People that you blessed and befriended in the here and now will remain in contact with you then. They will welcome you into their homes. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Luke 16 verse 9 I trust you can see the wisdom of God in removing all requirements to be righteous. You don't have to perform acts of godliness to remain right with God. But in light of time and eternity, it makes sense to do things that hold promise for the present life and the life to come. Day 10 You are free now. Part 2 So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free, and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Galatians 5 verse 1 NLT If the police gave you permission to murder ten people, without being punished by the law, would you go on a killing spree? Is the fear of going to jail the only thing stopping you from killing people? I doubt it. You are not a murderer. But the devil certainly is. It is his nature to steal kill, and destroy, because he is wicked. But evil is not part of your nature as a child of God. You are a life-giver, not a life-taker. When you are set free from rules and regulations, you still want to live a moral life, because you are a holy and righteous person. It is true that the power of sin can still operate through your moral body, see Romans 6 verse 12. As a result, you will often find yourself giving in to evil desires and doing the very things you don't want to do. Some days, you will let sin reign and feel miserable. Other days, you will express your new self and feel satisfied. If you want to express your new self more consistently, you need to take away the power of sin. The Bible teaches that the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 56-57 The scriptures are clear that apart from the requirements of the law, sin lies dead. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Romans 7 verse 8 in other words, any time you subject yourself to living under a list of requirements to be right with God, you are giving life to sin. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. Romans 7 verse 9 To successfully overcome sin in your life, you need to get out of the dark, cramped caves of self-righteousness, and start traveling the beautiful world of grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14 If you insist on trying to live up to a list of requirements to stay right with God, you are breathing life and strength into sin and keeping the devil armed. As long as the devil is armed, he can condemn you, and as long as you feel condemned, you cannot experience life in the Spirit, which is your only hope of living a genuinely godly life. I am convinced that many believers are not experiencing life in the Spirit, because they still think God is condemning them for their sins. How can we take hold of our Father's hand with confidence, if we still believe He is pointing His finger at us? We can't. As a result of this wrong believing, our hearts condemn us, we have no confidence before God, and we struggle to receive anything from Him. The opposite is also true. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. 1 John 3 verses 21-22 The more freedom you experience from condemnation, the more good things you can receive from God. But doesn't John say, we must keep God's commandment to be free from condemnation? Yes. But what is that command? 
and this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son Jesus Christ, and love one another, as He gave us commandment. 1 John 3 verse 23 The command you must obey to please God, is to believe in Jesus, which means believing the gospel. As you persevere in faith, the Spirit will produce love in your heart, and that love fulfills the goal of every commandment. See Romans 13 verses 8 to 10. All you have to do is receive God's love, and give it to others. John goes on to make it clear, that you can only love, because God first loved you. We love each other, because He loved us first. 1 John 4 verse 19 NLT Take a few moments to let this life-changing truth sink deep into your heart. Loving others with the love you receive from God, is how you have been commanded to love. As you believe, rest in, and explore the finished work of Jesus, the Spirit will draw God's character out of your heart. He will bring forth love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is poignant that Paul writes, Against such things, there is no law. Galatians 5 verses 22-23